Michael Davidson. I'm Mike King. Welcome to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Hall of Fame Museum in this edition of Indy 500, The Classics. Now, this is the Sheraton Thompson Special that A.J. Foyt drove in the 1964 Indy 500. And Donald, many of the top drivers came to this track in 64 having to make a decision. Drive the front engine roadster or the rear engine cars. Racing was getting very, very expensive. The rear engine cars were coming in, but they were new. A lot of the drivers didn't know if they could rely on them yet. So they would drive for a team that had at least one of each. And it was during practice they would decide is it going to be the rear engine car or one of these? Well, let's take a look at qualifying for the 1964 Indianapolis 500. Qualification day arrives, and with it, the need to make a final decision. Farnelli Jones still thinks of trying the new rear engine car, but he has a thorough driving knowledge of the front engine roadster. Roger Ward made his decision last year. Bowing to the trend toward smaller, lighter cars, he's ready to qualify his Watson-built rear-engined racer. Despite a gusty wind, he's turning the fastest qualifying laps in the history of the time trials. The low profile of the rear-engined car proves it's worth here. greets Roger Ward with congratulations on a new qualifying record of 156.406 miles per hour. Bobby Marshman in a tiny British built Lotus goes even faster, eclipsing Ward's record with a speed of 157.867. It's a hot, fast day, and his pit crew wonders how long the new record will stand. cars continue their successful invasion as Lynn Sutton qualifies his low-slung Offenhauser. The hard luck driver of 1963 feels the tide has turned as he posts a solid 153.813 miles per hour. Jim Clark, champion race driver of the world, posts a new one-lap record of over 159 miles per hour. His four-lap average of 158.828 makes him the fastest qualifier and the man to beat on Memorial Day. The skillful Scotsman becomes the first foreign driver to win the pole position since 1928. Parnelli's smooth technique for touring the track has won him the pole position for two consecutive years. Now, with the handicap of a sick engine, he concentrates on getting as far forward as possible in today's field of qualifiers. Good speed, better than 155 miles an hour. He takes the checkered flag with a four-lap average of 155.099, making his car the speediest of all the front-engine roadsters. Let's wait for race day, he says. With a good engine, we'll really go. Strong winds plague late afternoon qualifiers, but A.J. Foyt, national driving champion, puts his Offenhauser-powered roadster in the starting field with an average of 154.672. Jim Hurtabee's, his wrecked car repaired, qualifies at better than 152 miles per hour. Others try, some fail, but the first qualifying weekend ends with 21 drivers in the starting lineup of the fastest field in 500-mile race history. During Tuesday's practice session, Bobby Unser takes to the track in a new four-wheel drive Novi. The powerful supercharged engine blows apart.
front straightaway, Paul Russo loses a wheel. The 50-year-old grandfather gives one of the best driving exhibitions of the year. Controlling the crippled car by skillful manipulation of the brakes, he avoids the wall and coasts to a stop on the grass. With the wheel following behind. Bobby Unser of Pikes Peak Hill Climb fame turns out to be the hero of the three-car Novi team qualifying at 154.865 miles per hour. His pit crew thinks this is okay. His mother thinks it's simply wonderful. And Bobby is happy too. Dempsey Wilson tries to find greater speed. and loses it all in the first turn. For this disconsolate driver, it'll be another year before he can try again. Bill Cheeseburg qualifies at the relatively slow speed of 148.711 miles per hour. He wonders if he'll be bumped from the field by a faster car, the most gnawing question a driver can ask himself. Trouble in turn one. Rookie Bobby John spins the unconventional sidecar machine. Smokey Eunuch's dream car is out of contention. Bob Wenny heeds the instructions of his crew chief and becomes the last successful qualifier for the race. While Bill Cheeseburg and Ozzy Osbourne, his car owner, welcome the final gun. trials have ended for 1964. It's a mixed bag lining up for the 1964 Indianapolis 500 with an all rear engine front row and Carnelli Jones and A.J. Foyt have decided to stick with their trusty roadsters. So who's going to win the 1964 Indianapolis 500? Let's find out as they drop the green flag on the 33 car field. Race day, and the 33 cars, like strange, mute creations from some other world, are pushed to their starting positions on the track. Tension builds in the 350,000 spectators, but Parnelli Jones sits quietly while Foyt checks on final race strategy. Ascending clusters of balloons signal the drivers to make ready. Abreast behind the pace car, they sweep through the first turn. Clark jets his way into the lead.
Scotsman continues to pull away. engine cars are running one, two, three. McDonald is out of control. Drivers attempt to thread their way through the spreading planes. Some make it, others don't. Ronnie Duman stumbles over the wall and sprawls his way to safety. Firefighters slash at the flames with fomite while drivers stand in stunned disbelief. For the first time in Speedway history, the race is stopped for an accident. It is with deepest regret that we make this announcement. Driver a hush greets the news that veteran Eddie Sachs and Dave McDonald were lost in the crash. The 26 remaining cars are pushed into single file. The green flag falls and Clark's Lotus screams into action. A cloud of dust obscures the northwest turn, its absorbent powder used to dry out the track. Clark blasts through with Bobby Marshman in hot pursuit. Marshman's white number 51 has taken the lead. a short drive triumph though seven laps later marshman coast to a stop in the infield out of oil the ever-present cleanup crew mops up his trail like a stepped-on toy when a rear suspension fails. Using all the driving skill that has made him an international champion, Clark guides his car off the track while the hero of the Roadster set, Farnelli Jones, roars into the lead. The most promising European challenger in three decades walks back to a suddenly silent pit. Third place, Roger Ward is coming into the pit. Practice deficiency gives him a full tank of racing fuel in seconds, and he is on his way without losing his position. Back on the track, Arnelli Jones and A.J. Boyd duel in a hub-to-hub -hub contest for first place. Spectators watch tensely as Jones powers into the pits. With $150,000 at stake, his crew springs into action. Check tires, fresh goggles, fuel. Now 
help push him off. Something's gone wrong. His car's on fire. Jones deliberately steers into the pit wall, bails out of the car, and rolls over and over, trying to extinguish the flames. and the fit crew help save Parnelli while fans and friends give prayers of thanks to see the plucky driver safe on his feet. His car is burning furiously and firemen battle to confine the blaze. Old 98 is out of the race. Now running in first position, A.J. Foyt makes his first pit stop. This is the most critical moment to be faced by his crew. One minute lost here will cost him the lead. A stalled engine might cost him the race. He takes on fuel but no tires, saving precious seconds that will enable him to return to the track before Roger Ward overtakes him. leaders of the race now have retired from competition. The crowd wonders if A.J. Foyt will have better luck. Foyt is very conscious that two-time winner Roger Ward is waiting for the opportunity to pass him. Dan Gurney, driving the last remaining Lotus, pulls into the pit. The crew is having trouble with the platform jack. Desperately, they look for a substitute and find an old-fashioned manual lift. A little over two minutes later, Gurney returns to the track with three new tires and a load of fuel. halfway point, it's Point, Ward, and Perdebees. <laughs> Former winner Troy Rutman signals he's safe, but out of the race with a blown tire. and Ward continue their 1-2 battle with Foyt turning laps at 153 miles per hour. Foyt's pit crew proves to be as speedy as their driver. They give him a clean windshield, a drink of water, and a full tank of fuel in 22 seconds. goes out on the 161st lap. His overworked engine in fragments. This fastest 500 has lost 19 of the 33 starters. Foyt's relentless pace has put him in position to lap second place Roger Ward. With but four laps left in the race, Don Branson retires from competition with a broken clutch. Having outdistanced all of his competition, Foyt sweeps through the final lap and takes the checkered flag. Roger Ward, a lap behind him, heads for second place honors. A.J. Foyt steers toward victory lane, where sincere good wishes and the winner's pot of gold await him. 
His record speed of 147.350 miles per hour will spur new effort, new products, and new strategy in the competitive world of racing, just as surely as it will point to new designs for everyday transportation. But at this moment, A.J. is oblivious of all but that for the second time, he has won the Indianapolis 500. You can still see the battle scars at the Sheraton Thompson Special that AJ won this race in. Uh, still there, they have not been removed. This car ran a few more races in 1964 and then was retired. It sat for just a short time and then turned over to the museum. And I think it adds to the authenticity. You can over restore a race car. This is as it ran. For AJ Foyd, win number two in 1964. For Donald Davidson, I'm Mike King. Thanks for being with us for this edition of Indy 500. Good